right, indeed. No, indeed. Indeed. Um, are we uh, testing, t testing, testing, one, two, three? People can hear me at the back? Yes, good. Um, okay. Uh, the, uh, I want to start promptly because I've got a, a complicated story to tell today, uh, explaining uh, how the series of accidents uh, which led to the abolition of slavery in Brazil um, and uh, Brazil becoming a republic. Uh, so, um, the, uh, uh, and also the, the great cultural transformations of the 19th century in Brazil. Um, uh, so, the, uh, so it's a list of topics, independence, slavery, spiritualism and positivism, uh, and the war at the end of the world. Um, and, uh, you'll, and my uh, opening um, slide, or my title slide today, is, is a wonderful um, painting um, showing uh, these uh, mounted um, warriors uh, in this um, period of uh, upheaval uh, at the beginning of the uh, 19th century uh, when um, the uh, contest was on uh, between um, Brazil and Portugal, whether um, Brazil was going to remain part of Portugal um, or whether, on the contrary, it was going to um, break away. Uh, and, um, and, and this is a period of confused military action, um, much too complicated for me to give you all the details, but, uh, but I think the picture gives you some idea of um, uh, the, the kind of forces involved uh, and um, the, the kind of uh, uh, dispersed uh, and peculiar military situation which was faced uh, by uh, the Portuguese forces um, in Brazil at the beginning of the 19th century. So, um, uh, let's uh, have the recap and uh, some sort of outline of what's in the lecture. Uh, in the first lecture, we mainly talked about the earliest colonial history of Brazil, the influence of feudalism, which was mainly a legal influence because there wasn't any real feudalism in Brazil, um, uh, of sugar and slavery, uh, the first 150 years. In the second lecture, uh, we looked at the opening of the interior, at the rise of a new economy based on pastoralism and on mining, uh, at a new Baroque culture uh, with the wonderful architecture, uh, sculpture, and, um, uh, and carving of um, uh, Minas Gerais, the, 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 this a uh, new province which was opened up in the interior behind the mountains uh, by the Bandeirante pioneers uh, and at the effects um, of outside pressure, uh, pressure from England in the form of the Methuen Treaty um, and, uh, and pressure from Portugal's reforming dictator, the Marquis de Pombal. And the, the Marquis de Pombal is it was something of a hero and something of an anti-hero of yesterday's lecture because, of course, he was enlightened in many ways. He was a pioneer scientist uh, and he had very um, positive ideas about uh, public administration uh, and, um, and he was um, uh, uh, tolerant in the sense of uh, putting an end to old uh, anti-Semitic practices um, and also, and I don't think I mentioned this yesterday, uh, in the case of Brazil was the first person to have a positive policy of outreach uh, to indigenous peoples. He uh, theoretically at any rate invited them uh, to become part of Brazilian civilization. Uh, and um, so in many ways he had um, a very positive, forward-looking and modern ideas. He was a man of the Enlightenment, but uh, he was a classic enlightened despot. Um, he didn't like it when he didn't get his own way, uh, and he was very powerful and very efficient at twisting people's arms, uh, at punishing dissenters, uh, and, and generally forcing people to do what he thought was the right thing to do. Um, so, of course, uh, when uh, we moderns uh, agree with him and think that uh, what he wanted was the right thing to do, we tend to want to applaud him, but I think 
there were some examples of policies which he followed which were misguided, uh, and, and certainly um, it was the case that uh, many people uh, who approved of his ultimate ends disapproved of his means, even at the time. Um, and, and of course there was resistance to him, uh, and I, at the end of the lecture um, I looked at uh, the uh, main resistance in Brazil, which was the conspiracy of the Mineiros um, in the uh, 1790s, um, or uh, rather, of course, in the extraordinary year of the French Revolution, 1789, uh, an attempted revolution in Brazil in that same year, as the, as the um, States General was being called in France, uh, but it was betrayed and, um, and the leader, uh, Tiradench, uh, was actually sentenced to death and executed. So uh, an extraordinary um, kind of moment in the history of Brazil. And in today's lecture, we're, go uh, we're going to briefly look at an alternative theory on the unification of Brazil. Um, the, the, the parting shot yesterday was my discussion of the economist Chelsea Furtado's uh, idea that the Marquis de Pombal, um, with his uh, administrative reforms and centralization, uh, was uh, in some sense the person who preserved Brazil, uh, preventing it from disintegrating into a multiplicity of different Portuguese-speaking countries, um, as happened to the Spanish empire in the new world. Uh, and there's an alternative theory, which is due to the American historian Stuart Schwartz, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, and then I'm going to give some narrative, um, very sketchy, because the actual history is incredibly complicated here, uh, and um, uh, 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 about how the monarchy came from Portugal to Brazil. Uh, and how it eventually separated um, so that a, uh, a junior branch of the uh, House of Braganza became the emperors of Brazil. Uh, and then some account of new intellectual currents in the 19th century. Uh, there was already some uh, indications of liberalism uh, in the 18th century, but in the 19th century, things get rather more complicated uh, because of uh, the importation of um, a really a radical new intellectual currents, uh, positivism from France, uh, and spiritualism. Uh, from the United States uh, and also from Switzerland. Um, and, uh, and finally, we have the dramatic story about how the struggle over liberating the slaves led eventually to the abolition of the monarchy and the establishment of the First Republic. Uh, and finally, we look at how an unpopular military regime provoked a millennial uprising in the backlands, which could only be put down with great loss of life, uh, giving the new republican institutions a baptism of blood. Uh, the extraordinary story um, of uh, the great uh, Brazilian national epic uh, about uh, the uh, destruction of Canudos. So um, that's the, what I'm talking about today. So let's um, start by um, giving you uh, some account of uh, the alternative theory about um, why um, Brazil had a unified history uh, and did not break up into a whole lot of different republics uh, the way um, uh, Latin America did. Uh, sorry, Spanish Latin America did. Um, now, unlike uh, Chelsea Furtado, who stressed the influence of centralization under Pombal, the American historian Stuart Schwartz, um, uh, in a wonderful book called Sovereignty and Society in Colonial Brazil, I have the uh, reproduction of the dust jacket there on the left of my slide, uh, and in a second book, uh, which is rather less uh, radical and less pioneering, but consolidates his interpretation called Sugar Plantations in the Formation of Brazilian Society. Um, Stuart Schwartz saw the unity of Brazil as deriving from a network, a network of judges, 
uh, and lawyers um, who uh, were the boys from Bahia. And Bahia uh, was the uh, province of Brazil which was settled earliest. Uh, before you had the rise of Rio, let alone before you had the rise of Sao Paulo, uh, a number of those um, cities uh, in Bahia were already settled and were already uh, producing judges. Uh, and the argument uh, in sovereignty and society in colonial Brazil um, is that the, uh, the lawyers from the northeast were the people who were recruited into the civil service um, and uh, manned the uh, administration throughout Brazil um, and that they were a very strongly connected network. Uh, Stuart Schwartz's book uh, was, was a pioneer book in several ways. It used a whole lot of judicial records but in a way rather different from the way um, traditional legal historians um, have used uh, such records. Um, it was building up a, a personal picture of the personal connections, uh, the in intermarriages, the family alliances, uh, the processes of uh, sponsorship and patronage, which linked uh, the boys from Bahia uh, and meant that they were an effective network uh, which um, ran the show all over Brazil, uh, even in the south, even um, in, in the north once uh, the Amazon area got opened up. Um, so uh, the old judicial capital of Brazil, which was in the northeast, um, produced these judges. These judges uh, and other lawyers, I guess, advocates as well, um, were the uh, people who were recruited into the um, Brazilian civil service, um, as well as ma uh, manning the traditional um, judicial posts. Uh, and it's this group, according to Stuart Schwartz, um, who ensured uh, that Brazil stayed as united as it did. So this is an alternative uh, explanation. Um, and it's an interesting alternative explanation. Uh, I was looking last night uh, while preparing this lecture uh, at um, Furtado's other book uh, uh, to see if he has any uh, kind of critical response to what um, Stuart Schwartz um, said, uh, but I couldn't find any. So this is a, a debate where I only know um, uh, the sort of initial salvos of the debate and I haven't um, seen the follow-up. Uh, but uh, I, I have my own opinion. I think probably both are right. Uh, I think that um, the, the influence of the Pombaline reforms was very great. Uh, and you see this, incidentally, in other areas, uh, notably with regard to the Catholic Church and welfare institutions. Um, and yesterday, I think I gave a slightly garbled account of uh, Pombal's uh, efforts with regard to uh, reforming the, um, uh, the welfare system. Uh, in Brazil. Um, the crucial point really, which I don't think I got right in yesterday's lecture, well, at any rate, I didn't get clear in yesterday's lecture, uh, was um, the reliance on lay fraternities. That is, uh, groups of Catholic laymen um, who were organized usually um, uh, around the name of some saint or some uh, particular uh, personal leader. Um, uh, and these fraternities were the people who administered the orphanages and uh, the hospitals and the various other uh, welfare institutions of Brazil. Um, so uh, 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 when I said that Pombal was interested in state interference uh, in the welfare system, and in some sense uh, his admirers have um, probably um, uh, magnified that into kind of saying that he was a, a pioneer of the welfare state. It's not quite right. Uh, he was certainly interested in reforming the system, but um, the main uh, implement on which he was relying was these organizations of Catholic laymen, uh, the, uh, the, the religious fraternities, uh, all of whom were uh, subjected to a kind of state regulation, uh, but also uh, kind of encouraged uh, to um, 
uh, broaden their activities and uh, make sure that uh, welfare was provided on a, a kind of regular and uniform basis. So, uh, Pombolin reforms, definitely important uh, and definitely uh, contributing to the infrastructure uh, and the, the general um, uh, unity of Brazil, uh, but um, I think Schwartz may well be right in that uh, the personnel were also important and, and the, the boys from Bahia uh, were the, the backbone of the situation. Now, let's uh, go to the narrative. Uh, in 1808, uh, the history of Brazil changed forever when the British Royal Navy evacuated the Portuguese court to Rio to protect them from Napoleon. So, uh, so this is the, uh, the period of um, the uh, post-French uh, Revolutionary Wars uh, where the British and their allies are fighting back against uh, Napoleonic Europe. Uh, and Napoleon, of course, uh, invades uh, Iberia, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, uh, and the British uh, kind of um, uh, send forces to uh, try and liberate the Iberian Peninsula, and it's a long, drawn-out process. You may recall that uh, there's a phrase about it uh, which is often used, the Spanish ulcer. Uh, it was the Spanish ulcer which uh, caused the Napoleonic Empire to kind of bleed to death. Uh, so, um, uh, so the British were heavily involved. They were worried about um, the fate of the Portuguese monarchy, the Portuguese, their oldest allies. So the easiest thing to do uh, was to actually um, send a fleet um, to Lisbon to transport um, the Portuguese court lock, stock, and barrel to Brazil. Uh, and here you have a rather fine painting. It's by an English artist, um, and I've now forgotten his name, I'm afraid. Uh, but um, it shows, of course, the, the British fleet carrying the, um, uh, the, um, the, the Portuguese royalty and their hangers-on um, to Rio. So you can just about make out the sugar loaf in the background. And of course, you see that these are very sizable galleons, quite different from the, the tiny little ships which were the pioneer ships um, for uh, Columbus and Magellan and those people right at the start of the European uh, kind of expansion. Um, so um, here they are transporting uh, the Portuguese royal court to Rio. Um, and, uh, the, and this was a, a most extraordinary thing. Um, it stirred up local patriotism in Brazil. And as uh, I was already remarking in yesterday's lecture, uh, there was a considerable feeling, uh, especially, of course, in Minas Gerais, uh, that um, uh, Brazil was uh, the um, essential backbone of the Portuguese empire, uh, and it was the, um, the bread basket, or the, uh, at any rate, the money um, chest, because, of course, of the gold uh, discovered and mined in Minas. Um, but the gold, of course, steadily ran out during the course of the uh, 18th century and ran out altogether in the 19th century. So if you go to Ouro Preto, uh, one of the striking and sad things is you find this elaborate um, uh, sort of Victorian-looking city hall, um, which only functioned for a period of 10 years, uh, because that was how long um, the gold uh, was continued to be extracted um, after uh, 1820. Um, and uh, uh, so the, uh, the whole uh, mining economy uh, of um, Minas changed radically during the course of the 19th century. And I'll say a bit more about the economic changes uh, tomorrow. I want to concentrate today on the political history uh, because, uh, as I said yesterday, there was already um, a feeling in Brazil, uh, widespread, particularly among um, the newly uh, affluent uh, members of the uh, mining uh, elite and the, um, and the, the sort of uh, uh, liberal professions uh, that Brazil should be um, independent or it should be um, able to kind of ass uh, assert its full weight uh, 
um, in, the, in the Portuguese world. Um, and so uh, the arrival of the, um, the court stirred up local patriotism and it gave rise to the idea that Brazil should be a separate kingdom with a liberal constitutional monarchy. And, and so uh, one of the important things which happens is the acceptance uh, by the House of Braganza of the idea um, of being a constitutional monarchy. Uh, this um, had already, of course, been discussed uh, in the 18th century. Um, the Marcus de Pombal um, blew hot and cold on the subject of constitutionalism. Uh, as a progressive, he tended to favor it. Uh, as a dictator, he tended to distrust it. Um, so, uh, he, um, so it hadn't been adopted, but it, it was uh, one of the things which progressive uh, liberals were talking about uh, and had been talking about for some time, especially after the French Revolution, um, and this uh, uh, was eventually accepted by the House of Braganza. Uh, however, this proposal was controversial on both sides of the Atlantic. And one of the things which happens uh, in this period is uh, that you get in Portugal itself, as a result of the Napoleonic invasion, uh, the mobilization of uh, liberal uh, and patriotic forces um, so that uh, Lisbon itself acquires um, a parliament, the Cortes. Uh, and the Cortes were, of course, uh, very determined to have their say about uh, the future of Portugal and Brazil. Um, uh, and then on the Brazilian side, um, uh, the, uh, the situation also gets complicated because of um, the fact that um, Brazil is a, a country of uh, multiple uh, regions. Uh, each region had to have its own say on this matter. And, and here, of course, one sees the, the unity of Brazil being tested. Uh, and, and again, there are military complications because uh, already in the 18th century, militaries had tended to be localized, very often um, a kind of uh, the uh, retainers of a single um, powerful uh, local individual. Um, people talking about uh, politics uh, in the early uh, democracies often talk about uh, a period where politics is dominated by notables. Uh, this um, uh, terminology uh, is due to the French uh, historian Daniel Alevi. Uh, wrote a great book about French politics called The Era of Notables, um, but it's been uh, adopted widely in other parts of the world, and certainly uh, Brazilian politics right through to uh, the 1930s, I suppose, was uh, very much a, uh, a politics um, of notables. So these major families and their retainers uh, were often militarized, um, and, and they are the people you see in this, uh, this, this kind of painting. The forces are getting together uh, and finding either that they're on the same page or that they're not. Uh, and the one region which did um, attempt to secede, and eventually, in fact, did succeed in seceding, uh, was Uruguay. Uh, a, a slightly complicated case because um, it was a southern border region where there were substantial numbers of Spanish speakers. Um, and, uh, but Uruguay uh, eventually um, was uh, conciliated uh, and, and, and here the, 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 the Brazilian liberals were put to the test uh, whether they could do a, um, an effective uh, conciliation without uh, major military confrontation, um, and Uruguay did eventually um, uh, secede from the um, nascent Brazilian um, uh, state, uh, I think in 1828, uh, but uh, I hope I'm getting my dates right today. Um, I've, uh, I had very little sleep last night owing to a power outage, 
which inter interfered with my pre preparing my, um, my slides. So I, I haven't had the opportunity to check my dates, and this may be a year or two out. Um, but I think it's 1828. Uh, anyway, the, um, uh, the, the, the story about the, the wrangles over uh, the Brazilian uh, monarchy uh, is quite complicated because different members of the royal family took up different positions. Um, eventually, uh, we get acceptance of the idea of a constitutional monarchy, uh, a constitutional empire. There are problems about legitimacy. Uh, to achieve legitimacy, the monarchy needed the endorsement of the people and a covenant before God. And these two aims were pursued in a very public coronation ceremony, of, uh, 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 which, uh, once again, I have a wonderful painting. Um, the, uh, uh, and, uh, and, of course, you must understand that um, uh, elections and electoral politics were very primitive uh, in uh, this period, um, even in established uh, proto-democracies like um, the United Kingdom and the United States. Um, so the assent of the people was somewhat nominal. Uh, and, um, uh, and of course, uh, the assent of uh, God was uh, entirely mediated through the uh, Catholic Church. But here we are, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the coronation ceremony. Um, and, and then uh, there was this question of um, whether there was going to be loyalty towards the king on the part of the Portuguese troops stationed in Brazil, or whether some of them would not look rather to the Cortes in Lisbon uh, as the source of their authority. So uh, there's a period of uh, a really uh, intense and confused military activity around the country uh, where uh, kind of dissident forces have to be quelled. Uh, and. And, and some Portuguese commanders have to be sent packing and sent back to Portugal. Uh, and uh, eventually, uh, in order to achieve a kind of um, appropriate uh, settlement, uh, the Emperor uh, Pedro I uh, decided that he would um, make way for his grandson, who would be Dom Pedro II, because uh, he was born in Brazil, and so would be a Brasileiro, uh, and uh, this would uh, ensure his kind of loyalty to Brazil rather than Portugal. Um, but there's a period uh, of several years uh, before um, Dom Pedro uh, attains his majority uh, where uh, there has to be a regency council and, and three members of the royal family have to get together to uh, kind of agree on um, what's going to happen before Dom Pedro achieves his uh, majority. Uh, but uh, the extraordinary thing is that the new emperor, uh, Pedro II, uh, was a very good fixer. Uh, he was a natural politician from the word go uh, and was able to um, uh, take power into his own hands very effectively uh, already as a young man. Uh, and I think, um, uh, again, this is a complicated history and I don't know the details fully, but my understanding is that uh, attempts on the part of uh, kind of liberal professionals um, from the ruling classes in uh, Rio and Sao Paulo uh, had to be rebuffed uh, and were rebuffed partly because uh, these liberal politicians th were themselves very inexperienced and lacked uh, a kind of um, serious following, uh, particularly a serious following in the country. Um, and uh, so, um, the Council of Regency, his father and other senior male relatives, uh, withdrew to Europe, uh, while Dom Pedro II um, carefully balanced the local elites. And this was his function for most of his reign, uh, that uh, it was a case of allowing a, 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 a group of more liberal ministers to be succeeded by a group of more conservative ministers um, every so often. Uh, carefully uh, circulating the elites uh, 
uh, and ensuring that um, some sort of uh, stability uh, marked uh, the uh, social policy and the administrative functioning of the Brazilian state. Now, one of the major challenges to uh, the um, Brazilian state, uh, and in fact, in retrospect, the major challenge was the question of slavery. So I need to give you a little resume on slavery. Of course, I've been mentioning it in every lecture so far, but uh, perhaps it's worthwhile just taking an over overview and remind you that slavery was an ancient institution found worldwide. Uh, there are very few societies which have not had slavery at one stage or another in their history. Um, uh, and some of the slave societies, of course, are ones which we have tended to f forget about totally, like Korea, for example. Um, Korea was one of the most uh, intensely um, slave-owning societies on the planet uh, for a long period, but this is a history which most Westerners don't know about. Uh, we do know, of course, about slavery um, in uh, the Western world, particularly in the United States, uh, and um, the, uh, and of course we know about the Atlantic slave trade, which was an enormous transfer of population, um, uh, 15 or 17 million people, something of that order of magnitude, um, uh, a, uh, a tremendous outpouring of African populations, uh, depleting uh, whole regions of Africa. Uh, there's a, an amazing and heart-rending um, account of slavery in Angola, where um, the first Portuguese slaver to arrive there says, the country is teeming, uh, we will never exhaust slaves. And 300 years later, um, the mo more recent uh, Portuguese slaver arrives and says, uh, there are no slaves left. Uh, absolutely extraordinary, extraordinary horrifying story. Uh, there's a wonderful study done by some American economists from the National Bureau of Economic Research uh, in the 1990s um, where they look at um, the uh, countries which had the biggest drain in terms of number of slaves on the African continent and they look at the uh, present day economic performance of these countries and they find there's a very substantial correlation. That is, the countries which lost the most um, slaves to the transatlantic slave uh, trade were the ones who had the worst economic performance, uh, even um, 300 years later. Uh, and the explanation appears to be uh, that these uh, African societies where a large number of people were enslaved um, were um, uh, very uh, kind of uh, difficult societies with uh, high levels of distrust, basically because slavery was fed either by war, one would uh, make war against a neighboring tribe and the, and the captives would be um, sent off uh, into slavery, uh, or from debt bondage, people who uh, couldn't pay their debts uh, would be taken into slavery. Uh, and if you were in a society where uh, these things were commonplace, well, naturally, you tended to distrust your neighbors and distrust the local authorities who might well, uh, at some stage, uh, take you and your family into slavery. And so this um, idea is that uh, it's societies with high levels of trust uh, which have the best economic growth uh, and this is one of the hidden costs of slavery in Africa. Now, slavery had been decisively repudiated by advanced opinion originating among Quakers and other religious groups in North America during that uh, extraordinary uh, period of religious revival in North America known as the First Great Awakening. Um, historians have often seen the First Great Awakening as the religious origins of the American Revolution. But it was a lot more, uh, because uh, the, uh, the people who went to those revival meetings uh, out um, in, on the prairies and in the, in the mountains and the other backwoods of uh, American society found that uh, alongside them being called to Jesus uh, were uh, people who were not supposed to be there, 
like members of the lower classes, like women, and like slaves. Uh, and so um, uh, modern historians, uh, uh, most notably Robert Fogel, um, have argued that um, the, uh, it's the first great awakening and the second great awakening uh, which are, lie at the roots of uh, the American left wing history uh, of extending the franchise, of seeking independence from Great Britain and extending the franchise gradually to the lower classes, um, to women and to blacks. Of course, I've got it in the wrong order there. First to the lower class whites, uh, then uh, to um, uh, blacks in the American Civil War, and only in the 20th century to women. But uh, uh, slavery was repudiated uh, essentially because of religious uh, convictions in the United States. And the religion um, spread across the Atlantic and was taken up in Britain. So Britain uh, resolved to abolish the slave trade and took the decision right in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, and it was a major task of the British Royal Navy to apprehend slave ships at sea. Uh, and uh, we know this was a, a major task uh, right through the 19th century uh, because uh, there were uh, British um, uh, naval vessels which visited the Cape um, uh, and were based at the Cape uh, when they were patrolling uh, the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean in search of slave ships. So, so this is the origin of abolition, uh, and there was an abolitionist movement in Brazil itself uh, in the middle of the 19th century, and I've got a rather splendid picture there of Joaquim Nabucco, leader of the Brazilian abolitionist movement. He incidentally wrote a wonderful autobiography which is available in English translation. Uh, I, 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 I forcibly had to restrain myself from quoting it, uh, it's a wonderful read, and I've got it in my collection, but uh, it's too detailed, and I want to press on to say a bit more about some of the other revolutionary ideas uh, which were uh, broad in Brazil in the 19th century. Uh, now, in Brazil, there were many cultural forces making for modernization. One of them was positivism, uh, which was uh, a, a French doctrine um, it originated with the philosopher Auguste Comte, uh, and um, he had been um, secretary to the uh, possibly um, uh, more famous um, pioneer socialist, Saint Simon, Henri Saint Simon. Um, but uh, Comte was a, uh, a, a, a somewhat austere uh, man who concentrated on. Uh, the scientific aspects of his master's teaching uh, and left the uh, kind of uh, more weird um, socialist and religious aspect of San Simon's teaching to the San Simonians. Um, but uh, Comte himself produced a, a series of volumes called A Course of Positive Philosophy uh, in which uh, he developed um, a, a sort of theory of human history where it went through um, three phases. Uh, first of all, uh, the uh, kind of religious, uh, then the um, philosophical, and finally the positive phase. And so um, he saw his teaching as the apex of the positive phase and therefore uh, uh, called his doctrine positivism. Uh, and positivism, as conceived by Comte, uh, was um, a kind of scientistic, rationalistic version of Catholicism without the Pope. Uh, instead, there would be a supreme uh, authority consisting of a council of scientists uh, called the Council of Newton. Uh, and, um, uh, and they would hand down authoritative doctrine. Um, and of course, it was very important uh, for people to sort of keep together and for there to be kind of social cohesion, uh, as was envisaged in, um, uh, in Catholic uh, doctrine and teaching and experience, I guess. Um, so uh, the uh, positive launched itself as a new church. Um, and uh, the positivist church building still exists in Rio. Uh, 
Uh, it's a bit dilapidated and run down. I've got a slide of it there on the left uh, showing you what it looks like today. And there's a slide of the interior so you can see uh, how it compares uh, to a, a less rationalistic church. Um, and uh, the influence of, on, uh, of positivism on Brazil was absolutely startling. Uh, it was very much a minority uh, kind of um, cult in France itself. Uh, in Britain, it had a handful of enthusiasts they're mainly forgotten now. The one person who was briefly influenced uh, by Comte and who will, is a name known to many people in the audience was John Stuart Mill, who actually had an elaborate correspondence with Comte in the 1830s, uh, where each thought they were going to convert the other, but neither actually succeeded in doing so. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Comte uh, was uh, very much a, a minority uh, kind of uh, phenomenon in Europe, uh, but in Brazil uh, there were Comtist uh, followers through all the major um, uh, Brazilian uh, city, uh, cities and, and towns. Uh, uh, quite extraordinary the extent to which um, uh, positivism uh, was adopted uh, in Brazil almost as a national religion. But of course it, it tended to be confined uh, to uh, the middle classes, to trained professionals, uh, and more faithfully to the army and the navy. Now, um, the navy is the important one to keep uh, aware of there, uh, for reasons I will explain shortly. Uh, but um, there was a, a famous naval academy uh, just south of Rio, I think it's now actually part of Rio today, Rio's grown, um, uh, to embrace it, uh, where the, um, the lecturers uh, in the Naval Academy um, included a number of um, positivists uh, led notably by the professor of mathematics. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, and they were to um, uh, train uh, not just uh, naval officers, but actually also some people in the army. Um, so you got the development of a, a kind of positivist um, uh, br brotherhood, perhaps analogous to the, the boys from Bahia, uh, in that it was a, a, a network of people who uh, all interacted and thought alike, uh, and they were influential and were going to be faithfully influential, as we shall see in Brazilian politics. Um, but uh, the rise of positivism, of course, represents the decline of institutional Catholicism. And this had already been happening in the 18th century, and not just because of the Marquis de Pombal trying to um, reorganize the church. Uh, there was a shortage of um, vocations. A lot of, uh, there were very few people who wanted to go into the church as a profession. Uh, there was a shortage of priests sent from uh, Lisbon. Um, and so uh, the Catholic Church was undermanned already from the 18th century, uh, and, um, and this uh, kind of opened up uh, a kind of world of nominal Catholicism where people would uh, go uh, to church once a year, perhaps for the Easter communion, um, and it opened up, um, in general, a space for other religions. And the Marquis de Pombal, of course, uh, was not only welcoming towards um, uh, Jews, but also uh, towards other heretics such as Protestants. Uh, so um, uh, there was a growth of other religions, but the important one in the 19th century uh, was, the as I say here, the rise of more irrational religions, the most important of which was spiritualism. Uh, which was imported from both the United States and from France. Uh, there's a very strong French connection in the 19th century, uh, and um, the 
uh, and spiritualism is part of that. If you look at conventional histories of spiritualism, they usually start in Rochester, New York, uh, in 1848 or 1849 with the Fox sisters, uh, who were a bunch of teenage um, girls who produced various strange manifestations which they claimed were uh, the spirits talking. Uh, but in actual fact, I think uh, those conventional histories are, um, well, Conventional, and there's, a, there's an older uh, tradition of uh, table turning and seances. So I've got there a nice picture of a 19th century seance uh, in the left hand of the slide. But on the right hand side, um, I've got uh, the new super um, uh, spiritism um, uh, of uh, the 1860s and 70s, uh, Alan Kardec. Uh, now, Kardec is a name which probably means nothing uh, to everybody in the audience except me. Uh, but um, uh, I first became aware of Kardec uh, many years ago. Uh, I'd already been to Brazil and was already aware of spiritualism in Brazil, but somehow I hadn't made the connection. Um, but I was a uh, resident in Switzerland, I think it was in 1990, on a sabbatical year, uh, and I used to go down to Geneva. There's a wonderful uh, old uh, kind of windy little street with lots of second-hand bookshops going up the hill towards uh, Calvin's old church, uh, and uh, one of the bookshops there was an occult bookshop selling the complete works of Alan Kardec. Uh, so that was where I first became aware of this man um, who was a philosopher uh, born in the Swiss Romande, um, but he spent much of his life uh, in, in France, uh, and he was the person who systematized spiritualism and produced a first complete uh, 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 scientific account of the world of the spirits. Uh, and here is um, his gospel translated into Portuguese in my slide, uh, which happened uh, uh, sort of while Kardec was still alive, um, and by the 20th century, uh, spiritualism in Brazil had achieved extraordinary levels of popularity. Uh, this is largely due to popular novels, such as this uh, famous uh, novel, uh, Nosso Lar, Our Home, um, which is uh, due to um, a guy called Xavier, I think, Chico Xavier. Um, and uh, this is a novel which is known to every Brazilian. Uh, it's very much part of Brazil's folklore because it describes um, our home in the other world. In other words, the Brazil of the spirit. Um, so uh, it's a description of this other world uh, which has the same geography uh, as the actual Brazil. So you have uh, Pernambuco, you have Bahia, uh, you have um, Rio, you have um, Sao Paulo, and so on. Uh, and, uh, but they're inhabited by um, people who are multi-generational families from these regions. Uh, because they're all the dead from these regions who've been assembled there. Uh, so you have this extraordinary picture of the Brazil of the spirit. Uh, as I said, this, this novel is found everywhere in Brazil. It's, it's become part of the folklore. Um, and uh, it was made into a very successful um, uh, motion picture in when was it, 2010 or thereabouts, uh, and, uh, and, and of course that led to a further outpouring of paperback editions and, and so on, and, uh, and I think there are uh, also versions for TV and so on. It's an absolutely extraordinary kind of thing, um, and you will find that um, a part of Brazilian culture, and, and Brazilian culture in this respect is syncretic. They borrow little bits and pieces from here, there, and everywhere. Uh, Spiritism, in this sense, has uh, uh, been absorbed even by people who are nominally Orthodox Catholics. Uh, and um, uh, and it's, uh, it's the most extraordinary thing. I remember I was first struck by it when I went to Congoyesh uh, du Campus, which I talked about yesterday. Um, it's a wonderful pilgrimage site uh, created by Aleja Dino, uh, where you walk up the mountain looking at successive chapels showing the stages in the life of Jesus. Just down 
um, the road from uh, the, the sacred mountain um, is uh, the spiritualist hospital. Uh, something uh, like 30% um, of hospitals in Brazil are spiritualist foundations. Uh, and the spiritualist foundation in Congoish was particularly famous because at that time uh, there was operating um, a gentleman who styled himself the surgeon with the rusty knife uh, because every operation he performed was a miracle. Uh, it was an operation where um, he went into a trance and operated uh, with a rusty knife. Uh, of course, um, uh, something which would normally be fatal, uh, but uh, in his hands, allegedly, was completely safe uh, and was constantly uh, performing uh, m uh, kind of surgical miracles which nobody else, no conventional doctor, no ordinary Catholic could possibly duplicate. Um, well, uh, they did get into trouble later on uh, with uh, being sued by um, uh, patients who were not satisfied with the results, uh, but that's, that's a complicated story which I, I don't really know too much about. Anyway, 